Welcome everyone to DRJ's webinar series. I'm Bob Arnold, President here at DRJ. We thank you for your attendance today and hope you gather some great information from today's webinar. Well, you will have the opportunity to submit questions today's, to today's presenters by typing your question into the question pane on the control panel you'll find on the right hand side of your screen. You may send in your questions at any time during the pre presentation. We'll collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's session. Today's sponsor is Volvo and today's topic is the top 10 communication priorities during an active shooter event. Our presenters today are Dr. Robert Chandler and Felipe Portocarrero. Dr. Chandler is an internationally recognized expert on communication and has produced nine books and more than 175 scholarly and professional white papers. He has consulted globally with public and private sector entities as well as with leading emergency communication solutions providers. Dr. Chandler currently holds an academic appointment as Professor of Communication at Lipscomb University, as well as serving as the Communication Education Advisor for Volvo. Over a decade of experience in the technology sector specializing in communications, Mr. Porto Carrero, one of the founders of Volvo, is a pioneer in the development and application of tele telephony, digital communication, and automated weather systems. In 2007, he revolutionized the business continuity sector with the introduction of the Volvo Recovery Solution. In addition to his expertise in applications, he has also spearheaded the development and deployment of high availability remote networks to support the application side. With no further introductions, I'd like to welcome, turn the mic over to Dr. Chandler. Thanks, Bob, and um, I'm, I'm pleased to be here today. You know, of all the topics that I speak on, particularly involving communication and leadership and um, all of the processes of things that happen in the way that humans deal with events, disasters, uh, uh, severe weather, um, stress, decision making, even fatigue, that there's no topic that is more uh, frightening, uh, is more intimidating, and the urgency for knowing what to do, how to do it, and having the capacity uh, to communicate and warn people and alert them than an active shooter situation. Um, there was a time about oh, almost 20 years ago now where I gave a talk one day and uh, a person asked me a question about, well, if we're not the post office, do we have to worry about active shooters? And, you know, the irony of that question strikes me. Um, sadly, on almost a biweekly basis, as I see yet another uh, active shooter incident, and they're really, uh, whether you are in a healthcare facility, a school, um, a church or synagogue, um, a, a civic center, um, a shopping center, or a coffee shop, uh, they're really, there's no place that, 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 there's no context that one is immune um, from these outrageous uh, situations. And obviously, the more complicated your operations are, the, the bigger, uh, multiple sites, multiple campuses, um, the more complexities you have in terms of high mobility target audiences, um, you have uh, people who are working at, at, in various tasks, the more challenging the situation is, um, uh, the more difficult it is to communicate successfully. So this is one of those topics that uh, I feel that if there's any noble purpose at all for working to improve communication in all contexts, this is one that I feel particularly good about. Uh, I really think we're making a difference and uh, places that have adopted some of these tips and some of these priorities for communication are now performing better and we're gathering more and more evidence that indicates that this type of notification in active shooter situations really works. Um, and uh, I just finished reading a, a very comprehensive study that came out of the Pacific Northwest that looked at real-world situations where people utilize these communication priorities and, and, and notification technology that it actually makes a difference. So I'm actually feeling really good about this. This is one of those areas uh, where we can make a difference. So let's talk about it. Active shooter situations are scary. And they happen unexpectedly. I say unexpectedly, we all sort of have in the back of our minds that they could happen, but once they finally do, we're usually stunned and shocked that it's actually unfolding in front of us. And so and one of the things that, that happens is just the sheer pace 
that an active shooter event happens. And at the same time that it's happening quickly, you need to notify people quickly, alert them, get them out of harm's way, reduce their risk, minimize the dangers, and you have to do it very quickly. And so um, I start here with just a simple slide of, of the way this begins. Um, having an option for a single button uh, alert that's already planned, that's already ready to begin to alert the people that have been trained in advance, who know what to do, um, is where these events happen. And so, you know, we do stress studies on people, and we know that a lot of times uh, people really um, are unable to complete complicated communication tasks during periods of when they are experiencing even physiological stress, adrenaline, uh, they're if, if, uh, experiencing um, what we call affective emotional um, issues or even anxiety um, and psychological stress. And so one of the things that's very important is that you have a simple, well-rehearsed single action. And I say single action, and I really, I really have to underscore this. We have a certain percentage of people that can't dial 911. Um, at moments of fear and fright and at this sort of um, stress level anxiety or hyper stress. And so having a simple one touch approach to act quickly and a pre-programmed approach is so essential. And so uh, just generally speaking about communication priorities is that you have to have a well rehearsed, well trained um, communicator but, but as well as the target audiences. And I think that's very important. I think the other thing is that we have to begin to think about our audience. So let's start with the very practical. For high mo mobility based audiences, um, one of the, the important priorities, in fact I think there's two priorities, but I think that the, the first of those is that you can push some way of warning people, push, push your uh, alerts, your, your notifications, and be able to get to the targeted and preferred most likely avenues, uh, most likely devices, most likely channels, um, most likely modality within those channels and devices, um, despite what location they're at to alert them, and despite the fact they may be in motion or between stationary positions at the time. Um, and you have to be able to do that in a geographical uh, centric method. That is that you're able to alert the people who are at the most risk zones, or at least the places where people should take the precautions. I also believe that you have to have some degree of advance uh, education and communication so that people understand what such an alert means and what are some of the typical responses that they do it. And I think that's very important. And if you're not ready to do that, then, well, you're not ready. That's, that's bad. Um, that we want to be more prepared. We want to have increased readiness. Um, and we want to have increased capabilities of doing complex tasks at a very difficult and challenging time. But it's not just the mobility. I think just kind of a backbone approach to it um, is to look at um, all of the different uh, places and stations. So let me give you an example of a second priority. Um, and that is, is to get um, your individuals and get, to get people involved. Oops went too far, uh, get people involved at uh, workstations and work desks and uh, more of a traditional uh, system. Now, many of you will have, uh, especially if you're old school like I am, you know you know about uh, devices and digital signage and, and, and speakers and things. But in the modern world, the equivalent of that is usually computers, laptops, desktops, um, tablets that are being utilized um, in various places, campuses, workspaces, healthcare facilities. Um, and then that second thing is to give some sort of alerting system that doesn't increase risk. And in fact, I would suggest that rather than broadcasting on loudspeakers or audible warnings, which also alert your potential um, active shooter, um, having ways that people recognize it can get the message, that can get their attention perhaps through color coding, perhaps through uh, completely overriding whatever project they're working on, all of which are simple to accomplish, um, that you can have people begin to take action take place without even tipping off your active shooter, I think. And so getting the, that kind of traditional warning and those kind of capabilities. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of those um, intrusive messages that tell me to, um, uh, well, in, in weather and storms, that the tornado is coming. And, and in fact, no matter how important my work is, seeking shelter is more important. But in an active shooter situation, um, locking the doors and uh, shutting down. I was watching the video, I don't know if you watched the video of the uh, UCLA event that happened just last week, and um, that the doors were incapable of being locked and there was someone volunteering their belt. You can watch this on YouTube, I think, or social media. And they were trying to use their belt to tie the doors 
to a copy machine and trying to lean against it with weight to keep someone from opening the doors. I mean, those kind of steps can be done as long as people know a danger is coming and, um, in, in terms of working in terms of the facilities. So um, this is urgent. This is an urgent situation of being well prepared in advance. It's not. Active shooters are not situations that you can typically figure out as you go along. Um, I just, I guess I've assumed from the start, we all know what we're talking about with an active shooter, but the FBI defined an active shooter as an individual that's basically come to kill or attempt to kill people um, in a confined space. That's your building, it's a school classroom, it's a, a healthcare facility, it's a, a post office, it's, it's a workplace manufacturing plant, doesn't, it doesn't matter where it is. Um, and they can really occur just about any place that people gather. They can occur in government civic centers, and they can occur at community colleges, and and really um, uh, churches. <laughs> it's it's just amazing. Um, transportation centers, um, airports, train stations. Uh, they really anywhere that people are gathered together could be subject to it. And um, the thing about active shooters is, at this point, we don't really care what their motives are. Um, after an event, you can sit around all day and argue about whether it was terrorism or just murder. Um, it doesn't really matter. I'm sort of apolitical for terms of emergency warnings and alerts and notifications because um, it doesn't matter to me if it's a domestic dispute or somebody who's angry at the way they were treated um, or their loved ones were treated in a facility or their disgruntled former employee. Doesn't matter. Are there a motivated international terrorist? It, it, it makes no difference in terms of getting people to um, run, hide, fight, flee, uh, all of the things that have to happen at it. So basically, active shooter is a person who's trying to kill multiple people in a bounded space. A rapid onset. Um, everyone who's looked at it has always hoped to find the exact pattern of predictors or method and, and which way will they go and who will they shoot. Um, the problem is it comes very close to being random. It really varies on the situation. There's no single profile, as I said. There's no single motive for it. Um, in fact, the motives are so diverse, I can't think of any organization that could say, oh, well, no one would ever have a motive to come shoot up here. Um, you know, and, and, you, and you don't know the motives when it's happening, so the event's rather unpredictable. Um, the only thing I can tell you is that they're over quickly. Um, when you look at all of the active shooting situations that have been studied, um, the average time from first shot to the situation being over is really quite short life. Um, it falls around eight minutes, believe it or not. Um, it's, it's really quite stunning how quickly these situations unfold, develop. Um, now, that, that intimidates those of us who try to get the word out and warn people because you don't have a lot of time to start getting your stuff together and getting organized. Um, and um, while some do go longer, of course, um, the average, average life cycle of these is, is about eight minutes. And um, so the shooter either shoots themselves or moves on or there's a law enforcement intervention. There's a lot of different ways these things in. Statistically, though, the one thing that we do know from active shooter events is they, they actually are more likely to happen during normal business hours. And actually, if you think about it, it's not all that surprising. Uh, they're looking for groups of people. Um, the only ones where uh, they would be after normal business hours if you decide to go shoot up a nightclub. Um, uh, a disco hall or a music venue, then it will definitely be after business hours. But actually, most of them occur uh, during school hours. Most of them occur during normal work hours. And um, as we plan and think about these for our workplaces, um, occasionally the, the, the situation um, basically leads to an after hours um, involvement. The other thing about active shooters, if you look at the history of them, so let's go back about 15 years up to where we have data. We have hard data through about 2012, so a little over a decade of research. Uh, one of the things that we know over, over the decades and, and over since the last uh, 15 years or so is that active shooter events are increasing in their frequency. Um, you know, there's a, always a possibility that because of today's media and social media uh, that we, we know more about them, but actually, in fact, they are increasing. The FBI is very specific um, and has suggested that um, there has been an average of about six incidents per year, and that number has been increasingly, and that was, I guess, in 2000, 
to 2000, um, uh, through uh, I guess the, the end of 2012 into 2013. So we started with an average of about six of these active shooter events, and that number has now risen to um, about 16 uh, annually, uh, these active shooter events. And the direction is pointed upwards, not downwards. And there's some good research out there on these particular events. Um, and um, it's actually a problem that's growing in its seriousness and not diminishing. And so if, if you're not prepared yet and not have really thought through these types of, of plans, now's the time to do it and um, consider yourself, I guess, quite fortunate that um, it hasn't come yet. So active shooters, uh, there's no simple analysis of what they are and how they transpire, and likewise, there's no simple um, there's absolutely no simple way of completely mitigating it or even communicating about it once it happens. I think mitigating it is, is, is helpful. If you've installed security, um, if you've got uh, armed guards at the entrance to all your facilities and, and uh, they're prepared to deflect something, and metal screeners and, and gun detection as they come in the door, then you probably feel a little bit more secure. But I can tell you that, that active shooting events happen in some of the most secure places. Uh, within the last two years, we have active shooter instances in uh, courtrooms where people have been screened. Um, uh, we've had active shooting events on military bases where not only is there some degree of uh, uh, screening and monitoring, um, but that you've got a, um, a lot of other people who are uh, well trained in, in tactical prevention and response who uh, find themselves in the middle of these situations. There really is no absolute uh, security um, that, that completely prevents these. Uh, you certainly can help reduce the risk. So active shooter events, once they begin to unfold, because there is no single predicted pattern, um, they evolve unpredictably, and of course they, tra they transpire very quickly. And, and so if we're talking about trying to have communication priorities then, in this particular case, fast response, targeted response are things that we have to include in our preparation and planning. Um, we've got to communicate, first of all, in advance of these events to train people how to respond. And I, no set of communication priorities would be complete without talking about these um, events in advance. Uh, I think education is, is one of the most important things to communicate, provide people training, understanding. Also train them and, and give them um, the efforts that are being taken to both prepare, mitigate, and respond were such an events to happen. We have seen recently cases, I think UCLA uh, last week, all of the debriefing that I've had a chance to see and review uh, suggests that the people actually um, were far better prepared than so many of these instances, that they understood what to do, what was expected of them, and what was going on around them. Um, and so all they needed was to be alerted and warned to match that prior event education that allowed them to save their lives and take precaution. And uh, I, I think that's a, there's some really good lessons to learn by looking at that particular event. So in addition, though, um, to these advanced communication efforts, I think the ability to get these warnings to people quickly. Um, we've already talked about the speed and the rapidity that it happens, and also that it, it, it's very, you know, obviously distressing time period. And so simple, um, single act means of alerting people. I also think that it's important to get inbound information and communication. Uh, I think that that's very much important. Um, having the technology and tools to share that information and having a plan and procedures. Um, I, most of you are probably aware that the inquest is currently ongoing for the um, uh, Sydney, Australia, uh, Lint Coffee and Chocolate Shop um, active shooting situation. It ended up being a hostage taking situation. And that many of the people trapped inside of the shop were actually still able to communicate um, via text messages, both before and during um, the entire event. Yet very little was being done in terms of communicating information to them uh, as the event began to happen and unfolded. Certainly behavioral instructions would have been very useful. But perhaps the saddest part of that is that they were texting out intelligence information uh, mostly to family and friends and people for whom they had text numbers to send them to, 
then that was being reported, but yet was never integrated in the communication stream. So law enforcement never got the advantage that was coming from having eyes and ears inside the shop. Um, you know, and eventually, of course, that entire active shooter situation ended in such a horrible, tragic ending. Um, it really, really shakes me that um, they had no procedures in place to process inbound information. They couldn't take advantage of the communication channels they had. They had no one coordinating communication. And those are priorities that you can plan for now. And gathering information, even if you're doing it and you assume law enforcement's handling their own in, supplying what you know to law enforcement can be a great advantage to you. Um, many of these critical aspects can really save lives and uh, just prevent atrocities. Um, and, and the key to that is, is having communication coordinated. Um, sustained effective communication can minimize confusion, it can coordinate both the response and people's escape and survival, um, you can sustain control, provide aid, and you can certainly enhance success as well as recovery from such events. And I think it's tools and technologies combined with having procedures, processes, and plans in place, which of course is what I am most interested in. I am suggesting that um, readiness comes from putting those procedures and plans married to the absolute best technology for the situation and then becoming uh, proficient, becoming ready, demonstrating readiness, assessing, testing, um, um, training, getting people together so that when it comes, it comes rather um, fluid, it comes smoothly, and, and it, comes, it comes as effectively as can be in the midst of a very chaotic situation. I think being prepared to communicate effectively before, during, and after an event such as an active shooter is really um, the, the complete, simple summary of communication preparedness. Active shooter um, situations are, are obviously um, demanding. They require a lot of precision and a lot of fast action. Um, and, and probably compared to other unfolding events, uh, have a very short timeline for um, signaling and activation to trying to warn people. So in, in, so you've got to have a precise protocol. You have to have tested procedures, ensure that there were highly reliable and predicted tools um, that have been thoroughly tested in order to reach people. I actually believe you should have a series of not only advanced prepared messages um, or message templates, I think you should have training with people involved to understand what these messages and message templates mean, what's going on behind the scenes, and giving them behavioral instructions that they can draw upon to use in these events. And again, I think the debriefings I've read from the UCLA event uh, last week really underscore that. And of course, in general, advanced risk communication education is, is what's most important. We've got to get people more alert and aware. Um, now. So how does all this fit together? Well, you've got to have not only the plan, but you've got to have the tools. And so having some way of getting uh, verbal information, uh, SMS text-based information, email, um, particularly once people have sought shelter, maybe they're hiding, um, a quiet, safe means of gathering information about where people are located and what their status is, and even allowing them, like those hostages in the chocolate coffee shop in Sydney, when they're saying, here's what's going on, why aren't you taking note of this, uh, that that information can get back into the decision-making stream. And it's really using some of the modern techniques and tools becomes, um, well, it really becomes not just best practices, but it becomes the definition of diligence. Um, you really have to be able to coordinate all of this outbound and uh, returned information to key people, and you've got to be able to do this on the fly. You just never know exactly uh, when this happens and who's in what place. In fact, high uh, mobility to activate this and, and to pull data in. Uh, the tool should be incredibly simple. Um, the, the research is overwhelming on that, is that complicated procedures and complicated um, activation um, is a detriment. Um, you know, we find that response time uh, becomes very critical. Uh, particularly as people are confused and people's ability to complete even simple tasks diminishes. 
and um, I mean the, the only I mean the, the metaphor I can give you the image I want you to take away is a person who stands there yelling how do I dial 911 what what are the numbers and literally when they use their fingers to try and push the, the button phone um, they're missing the numbers and having to cancel and start again over and over that's the person I want to have an incredible simple task in front of them um, I think having um, a variety of ways and as these events go on um, having an ability to handle of high volume of information, people who are concerned about loved ones, people who are um, trying to find out about employees, students, uh, neighbors, people who were working temporarily in that facility or on that campus. Um, and if you can integrate all of this and then pull this back at the end, not only to help your own after action review, but to meet your documentation and reporting requirements and to help analyze what happened and what Long, um, to make it more effective. I think that's all part of the, the overall sense of preparedness. So let me let me give you ten short takeaways. Jot these down or, or, or download our, our webinar content afterwards. Um, and uh, we've actually got a very helpful um, little electronic book um, that that has this. You can download that uh, as well, and it will help you just kind of start with this planning process. So what are the ten priorities? Um, one. I think in advance we have to inform people, educate them, train them, and prepare them. They need to understand both how we're going to alert them, we've got to test their understanding of the kind of messages and message templates, and we have to provide them behavioral response and instructions. Again, the UCLA examples are very powerful. Um, during as the event begins to happen, our, we've got to be able to quickly notify and alert law enforcement, and it has to be done again as simply as possible and someone has to be assigned the responsibility. In fact, one of the questions that I ask for most of these things for emergency communication is behind the scenes what I challenge you is what needs to be communicated next? Who's responsible for that communication because we all think somebody else was supposed to do it? What resources are needed for that communication? That includes tools, templates, procedures, approvals, and everything else. And finally, what needs to be communicated next? Four simple questions that I ask about alerting people. So we're going to alert and warn people who are facing the threat or in immediate danger. Uh, hopefully, we've got that tied to um, where they are. And I think uh, geolocation is very important. I think we go back to the training they got in advance, and we communicate behavioral responses. And uh, if you've taught them the difference between shelter in place and evacuation, then that's great. I trust your training. They know how to evacuate or lock down. You're not going to start teaching it for the very first time. All you should have to do is say, shelter in place plan now active. And people should understand how to lock the doors or seal the unit, take cover, take protection from um, projectile fire, etc. All of that plan should be done. I think you've got to also communicate to your own response team members. Um, you may or may not have your own security or um, uh, you know, some sort of a connection with law enforcement. You might have safety officers. You might have uh, people who are responsible. Uh, you know, if you're a school, you have a certain person designated uh, to lock and seal doors. Um, so how do you communicate with them? That's also a level of your emergency notification alert plan to activate them and activate those plans. Then you move beyond the immediates. You've got to warn others. So if I've got a shift change coming in my manufacturing plant, um, I may have an entire new shift of workers getting ready uh, to start pulling into the parking lot, coming to their, to their workplace, and at that very moment I've got an active shooter incident, so how do I warn others there? If I've got a neighborhood and I don't know where this guy's going or this gal's going, um, actually statistically it's probably a guy, um, I, I, how do I warn them? Hey, who else do you need to start warning as you get beyond this? And then, then also, who, what communication do you have to coordinate? And partners could include, obviously, I think, law enforcement, uh, but partners may include all sorts of other, um, um, you know, constituents, everything from regulators to stakeholders um, to um, uh, a whole variety, you know, uh, the local hospital, for that matter, for surge issues. Who do you coordinate? What partners do you have? And, and then eventually, 
think about what we're going to say to the public and, and what we're going to do. And I, that's, uh, um, it's important. Notice it's not the first priority, but uh, it's important at some point to know how we're going to talk about this. And again, pre-planned communication, pre-planned target audiences, channels, and, and eventually um, picking up the pieces. You know, we spend a lot of time with active shooters getting people really um, hyped up. We get them urgently doing something. We, we ramp them up. Uh, at the end of it, we don't always do as good of a job ramping them down or, or certainly um, you know, bringing them back to some sense of normalcy. By the way, that's very important. Um, that's where people really crave information. They have high levels of uncertainty. Um, this is where fear sets in. Um, actually, the fear begins in the very start of it, but, but the real fear, fear fear for loss of their, you know, if the, if the buildings close, what do I do tomorrow? Confusion. Um, what's my schedule? You know, what's going to happen? And why is there police tape around my work site? What do I do? And, and eventually recovery communication, getting back to normal. So uh, an active shooter begins with that fast, rapid alert that's a simple process with simple messages that have been planned and rehearsed that people have training to draw upon about what to do. Um, and then basically you, you begin to go through it and spread out in concentric circles, the people you're warning, uh, the constituents you're accounting for, and all that communication probably needs to be managed and able to run um, while you yourself may be seeking shelter um, or fleeing or, or whatever it might be. And um, that's, a, that's a challenge. You know, that, that, that's, that's what this is all about. That's why this is difficult and this is really tough. Um, you know, when you focus in just on trying to warn someone, um, you've really got to have a resilient ability and capability. Um, I'm an advocate of multiple modalities, and certainly if there are preferences set by target audiences, those need to be taken into account. Um, I think that you have to um, you know, try to reach someone in, in the ways that are most likely to be noticed, and paid attention to, um, and perceived. Uh, I do think active shooters require an extra layer of thinking um, about that. So for example, with tornado warnings, uh, I like to have lots of bells and buzzes and, and alerts, warning alerts and things. I, I actually don't think those should happen in active shooters. I, uh, many people will be getting warnings um, and um, we need them to get noticed by the people involved to read them and pay attention to them, but I don't need, for example, to give away someone's secure location by having a um, warning chime going off. I mean, uh, we, we don't want to do anything that increases people's risk. We want to minimize risk. And I think you have to think about active shooters a little bit differently. Um, how do people find out things? You know, you're going to get people literally when their cell phone's trying to call in and get information. Um, you've got, of course, family, media, regulators, the neighborhood, community. Everybody's going to be calling in. So what, what's your backbone system? Are you ready for a denial of service attack equivalents um, in terms of a, a switchboard or PBX system or um, you know, even internet for that matter? Um, inbound, outbound, telephony, how do you sustain that? Uh, what kind of pathways? I think the other thing is that you should have redundant cellular connectivity. Um, you know, both for voice communication but also for SMS. I, you know, text messaging is very critical in these events because it can be done more silent than um, uh, perhaps a, um, a telephone ringing uh, might be. And it, it's something else. And by the way, if there are any issues at all with cellular capacity, let's say everything's jammed and overloaded uh, because this active shooter situation is happening, you know, one of the, the last things that, is, that, is, that will be able to be transmitted are going to be the short burst um, SMS text messages. So, you know, Using that kind of approach is very important. Um, and then, of course, there's just, as I said to those priorities, at some point you're going to have to deal with everybody else wanting to know what's going on, worrying about your employees, worried about loved ones, moms and dads, grandmas, and um, everybody's going to be calling. And so what, what is your ability to manage that? And do you have a system where you, you, they're not all flooding your one system? You know, where's your hotline? Where is your... Um, uh, web presence, where's your virtual bulletin board, um, and by the way, in using those same tools for your own people who may be having trouble getting through to report some critical information. It's not just inquiries, um, it's trying to sustain every level of communication at a time when there's every possible direct 
an indirect challenge to doing it. And that's, that's really what being prepared, um, I think, is, is all about um, in, in terms of these approaches. All right, so let me, um, I'm, I hope I'm still there with you. I'm having a display issue, apparently. Um, so what's the point? And this is way too much information probably for one slide, but you've got copies of this, and I'm not going to read it to you. So notification um, is something that people need. I think one of the bad things you can do is just simply go silent. Um, and not provide alerts and warnings and not provide updates. Um, I think it's very important to keep people updated. Um, you know, if you, if you really want some sad stories, I got a chance to talk to some of the uh, Sandy Hook School um, people who had taken shelter and were left for a long time while the shooter, they didn't know what was going on. Uh, if you have a way of communicating uh, that doesn't put them at greater risk, um, that's something that really needs to be part of your communication plans for an active shooter. You know, even if you don't have something new to say, um, just connecting them to the outside world while they're huddled in a darkened closet with a file cabinet pushed against the door um, is an incredibly uh, valuable linkage um, uh, for their own benefit, for their own health and well-being. Um, and I think it's there. I think having some pull technologies along with push technologies very well. So the people who are in these isolated situations, um, you know, they've already been trained. You told them to silence their their, their devices, but, but in fact they've been trained to go to look at a, maybe a particular web address or something to get updates. And, um, and there are tactical updates designed to comfort and reassure. They're not necessarily posting that the police are about ready to storm the building. Um, certainly not if the active shooter is watching your, 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 your dark site social media as well. Your job is basically to communicate so as to maintain the command, control, and coordination um, for, for all of your key people and for all of those who are there. And so once you issue an activation of whatever active shooter or mass shooting um, response protocol that you have, you then need to start notifying everyone down the checklist, starting with those at greatest risk, and greatest danger, and then all the way through with everyone else who is, is basically impacted uh, by that. And having that protocol and plan, having the right tools and people who are well trained, and having those on the target audience advance educated about the nature of communication and what they might expect to hear in certain situations is really um, the, the building blocks. And then using a uh, extremely efficient, uh, highly reliable, and very simple to operate, uh, I think intuitively designed as much as possible given the stresses involved in these situations is the right tool. And I, I suppose it, it using these gets you the ultimate ROI on investing in these systems because at the most critical times, it can make a difference. It can make a difference not just in saving people's lives and keeping people safe, but it can make a difference in terms of valuing the people and letting them know what a priority they are, um, which is affected to just about every other measurement that we have. And having a capacity to do this hundreds of times, and no, wait a minute, thousands of times, uh, to for thousands of target people in a matter of moments, maybe um, seconds, um, being able to do that, having it well rehearsed, may make very much the difference. And doing such will improve safety, will avoid confusion, will create um, you know, a psychological well-being, even if, if there's no immediate physical threats. And I think that's very much important. Um, simple, be able to launch it from different places, coordinate that information with advanced training and with advanced testing methods. And that's, that's in, in, in a very real nutshell, um, that's what it comes down to. Um, one of the things on the priority was having a plan in place for this, as these situations get resolved. I think training is very important for resolution. Um, many of you have done the law enforcement training. Many of you have done the, the show, show me your hands training. That, that's very important, but there's more to it. Uh, again, we've ramped everybody up and gotten their adrenaline running and their heart beating very rapidly. And now the thing is, how do we begin to bring them down? I think communication from a known and trusted source uh, someone with the credentials um, and confirm that source, you know, having them know about it. Um, and maybe even, um, you know, depending on your situation, we've even designed safe words or, um, you know, um, passwords for people to know this, you know, the shooter hasn't taken over the, 
company microphone and announcing stuff in the hallways. Um, I think an interactive system uh, during the aftermath, because the aftermath can be very chaotic, especially once um, um, law enforcement, emergency responders, paramedics, uh, EMT, all these folks are now here. Um, we're trying to get through it. You're trying to figure out what your operations are like, where your people are. You're trying, people are scattered. Um, you're trying to do all that. Having a communication system just to do some head counting just to find out situations and status is critical. Uh, reassuring them, answering their questions, you know, go home for the day, uh, you know, stay home, whatever it is. Um, those are real world things that, that have to be done. And if you don't have a communication protocol and plan, if you don't have the tools to do it or know how to get the word, even those situations present their own and generate their own difficulties and their own problems. And so really um, today's message is, is sort of sermonic in that it's really a call for that preparedness all the way through this event even to um, even to the even to the moments after the hours after and actually I should probably be dramatic the days, weeks, months and years after. But We'll, we'll, we'll concern ourselves right now with trying to get back to normal um, backup systems, um, you know, being able to do this. There's, it's so embarrassing to say, oh, we can't get in touch with anyone because so many people are calling, we can't even make a phone call out. You need um, some way to have um, a scalable, expandable system to make sure that you can do these things when you need to do them. Um, and uh, having that, and having it seamless, too. And uh, I think it's very important, and I think that's that's what's the advantages of having uh, modern applications that can ensure that you can get back to work quickly after an active shooter uh, situation. You'll have a number of issues. I think counseling, psycho psychological. I mean, even some traumatic and post-traumatic uh, issues. But all of that. Um, with, with help, with therapy, with professional care is very important and one of the keys to that is talking about it, sharing about it, getting information for where resources are, knowing how to take advantage of it which puts it all back in the valley wick of being able to communicate. Communication provides not just information but it provides order, it provides structure. Communication provides reassurance. Communication and the ability to stay connected, to hear from people is part of the solution. <coughs> Excuse me. It's part of the recovery, and I think that's what's most important. So I leave you with the rhetorical question: um, Are you ready? Are you prepared? Do you have the right tools? Um, do you have the right messages? Um, do you have the right people in place with those tools? And if you prepared your audience uh, to understand what all you're prepared to do and what you will be doing um, during such a horrific, God forbid. Um, disastrous situation of having an angry active shooter uh, there who um, provides such a terrible risk. And that, that's, um, you know, keeping connected is a way of staying protected. And that's, that's critical. And that's critical for managing these events, surviving these events, but certainly um, protecting people and um, helping them recover and initiate from it. And I think that's what's most important. Um, I, I think I've come real close to utilizing the uh, 45 minutes I was given. I, I tend to talk on and on. I promised everybody that we would have um, some time uh, before our hour ended uh, to take some questions and um, um, think this through together. I'm um, not sure I have every answer possible, and uh, at this point we brought some other folks on. Felipe is going to help me for uh, the really hard questions, and I can just keep quiet. But uh, but I hope I hope this is provocative. I hope as you think about it, um, you know these events have their own life cycle. They're not just one event. There's a whole series of unfolding life cycles. And the question I have to ask is, are you ready? Do you, you have the right tools, the right messages, the right processes, the right protocol to reach the right people at the right time? That's, that's it. That's where we are. So let me, um, um, Bob, do, have we gotten any questions that have come in on the um, question board? We certainly have. And thanks, Dr. Chandler, for a great presentation. We're now going to go uh, start beginning to answer any questions uh, that might have been submitted here today during today's presentation. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the question pane you'll find on the right-hand side of your screen. Our first question here today, has your technology ever been used for an active, sh active shooter situation? Um, this is Felipe. I think I can speak to that question. Um, we actually have had a situation in the past uh, several years ago one of our clients Halifax Medical Center uh, local here in Florida 
or local to Volo anyway, uh, they actually had an active shooter that came into the building and, you know, began shooting and, and I think attacked one of the nurses. And it was such, it was such a shocking event. And uh, at that point, you know, active shooters hadn't become what they are today. Although the you know the frequency had had started picking up a little bit, uh, but certainly not you know the biweekly that we're seeing now. And they were actually able to activate the the Volo tool set, both outbound and inbound, to get notifications through to the entire facility, and also up to executive management, which at that point you know was made aware through the technology and the tools as opposed to the media, which is you know in a lot of these events how. Um, how information is distributed. So it was, it made a difference then. And um, we actually, we learned quite a few lessons during that, uh, during that incident because we, we were able to receive critical feedback from the client. Uh, we, we actually incorporated a couple of new tools, I think after that event, uh, which were the tools that we highlighted up at the front that we learned are, are critical, which is one, uh, the ability to be able to geographically locate and identify uh, where your employees are, and uh, two, the ability to to provide what we call message intrusion. So, text messaging, voice messaging, email, they're still great uh, methods or modalities to get messages across, especially text. Uh, but we learned about push notifications and pop-up notifications and the power of those. Uh, with push notifications, you actually, since it's an app that you're installing on the person's device, you can actually physically see where they are on a map if they're in your building on your campus and target those individuals. Uh, desktop pop-up, same thing. You know you know that those devices or those PCs are in that building or on that campus. And so when they receive the alert, you know for certain that you're alerting people that are within the vicinity of that event. So, um, so yeah, we learned quite a few good lessons that we put in place. And, and it's part of the reason why we're talking about this today we think education is at the very top of the list, even really before tools, because there are a lot of companies that either don't have the support for tools yet or can't necessarily afford them yet. But uh, education, we've learned, is is primary. You have to identify who the who the first line is. You know, and at, at your facility, let's say you're at a medical center, your first line might be a nurse's station. If you're a retailer, it might be you know an associate. So you have to identify who your first line is, who the first people are that are going to know what's happening, and start from there. You know, train those people on what to do, how to respond. If you're fortunate enough to have tools, train them on how to use those tools, even at that level. The tools aren't always, you know, just for executive leadership or, or you know, the business continuity and disaster recovery folks. But you know, they're also for the people out in the field. All right, wonderful. Could you discuss some methods for inbound communications to be used during an event? Sure. Um, you know, we're seeing, at Volo, we've talked about inbound since day one. I mean, going back eight years, we've always thought inbound was, was critical, and, and we still believe it is critical because you don't always have the ability to get a message through to people outbound. And even if you do have the ability to get a message through to people outbound, you want to know what's happening on there, and then there needs to be a way for them to feed information back to you. Um, so obviously, you have uh, text messages where you can receive messages inbound. I thought Bob did a great, Dr. Chandler did a great job of speaking to that earlier. Uh, being able to take that information, receive it from people, for them to have a single phone number, a single text message number, for them to transmit information back to where you as the commander or responder or the person responsible can then aggregate that data is critical. Uh, in addition to that, having a single, for example, a single toll-free number, we happen to call ours the virtual bulletin board, but part of our program, part of our plan is anytime we have a client sign up, we want them to get this bulletin board and distribute that number to the entire workforce and let them know that whenever any type of event happens, especially something like an active shooter, all you do is dial this number, and the number will guide you through what to do. It could be as simple as you dial the number and leave a message back on the line or be transferred to someone else. Um, but again, not everybody has text. Some people are going to need a way to dial in via voice. And then finally, email. You know, al Although you, know, you don't necessarily think of email as an emergency communication method, it's still a great 
method for delivery of information. So one of the things you might want to think about is setting up an email address, a single inbound email address for incidents or events. Um, obviously, we could provide you with something like that, but that's, that's low-lying fruit in our industry. You could set up your own inbound email address where people uh, you know, can respond and send information to without even working with a provider like Volo. All right. Next One question. last thing I want to add about that, though, is not just being able to take the information, because you'll have a flood of information coming inbound, but also knowing what to do with it, how to aggregate it, and, and make sense of it. And that's really the key, I think, is not just being able to receive this information, but being able to figure out, one, can you trust the source, and two, you know, what do you do with that information? All right, final question here uh, submitted so far. And again, if anyone does have any any additional questions, you could still type them into the question panel on the right-hand side. So next question here, what do you see for the future of this technology? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, without, without giving away some of the plans we have in place, um, one of the things that we're seeing that I think is really interesting that we're, we're currently working on especially in these types of incidents, and as you start working with larger businesses, they have a big footprint. You know, a retailer, for example, a distribution center, a, a medical facility, these are huge locations with big campuses, and you have thousands and thousands of employees that are all over. And so the ability to identify exactly where someone is on campus, uh, we believe is critical. So not just, not just where they are, you know, level one, you know, it could be they're on the fifth floor of campus building number three. So being able to identify precisely where that person is within a facility, uh, we think is, is exciting technology that we're currently working on. We're hoping that, uh, you know, it continues to progress at the rate that we're seeing right now because that'll give us the level of detail um, and the correct information to help uh, to help companies better protect their employees and manage risk. Because perfect example is during an active shooter situation, you know, you don't necessarily, you might know where the shooter is, but you don't know exactly where all of your employees are. Imagine being able to, to physically see where they are uh, at that event. You know, some employees, you might tell them to evacuate. They're behind the shooter. He's headed in this direction. Other employees, you might tell them to shelter in place. Other employees, you might tell them to go to the roof if they're on the seventh floor. So you can make different decisions with, you know, with better information, and we believe that better information is on the way. All right, wonderful. Um, that was our last question submitted here today. If you do have any additional questions, you can still reach out to Volo. Their contact information is there on the screen for you. Uh, any parting words here today, guys? I have a couple of comments that I wanted to make about the presentation, and Dr. Chandler, I thought you did a great job going through the material. Thank you for that. Um, I, and I also thought you brought up some great, interesting points and takeaways. The eight minutes, um, that's not a lot of time. This is a traumatic event that happens really, really quickly, so you don't get a lot of time to react and, and, and really you know, make sense of what's happening. Um, that, for me, is a big takeaway. The other is awareness. In our industry, one of the challenges that we deal with every day is creating awareness, not just with executive leadership, but also with you know the average employee. And when I say awareness, I mean awareness about communications and about preparedness and recovery. People don't think about it until it happens to them. Well, with this particular type of scenario with an active shooter event, everybody's aware of it because it's happening so often. So I think that this could be used as a good reason to begin that cycle at any business, to begin the cycle of preparedness and the cycle of thinking on these terms. Uh, you may not use it for the active shooter event, but you may use it for something else. There could be you know, so, some sort of a weather event that happens. But because you were prepared and knew how to respond for an active shooter, that could help you better respond to a you know, weather event. Or you could have some sort of other outage or failure or some other disaster that because you had prepared for this one, which is, you know, a high visibility type event that you will get a participation from executive leadership on, you'll be prepared for other things. So I thought that was a good takeaway uh, that I wanted to make sure I called out here at the end. Well, no, and Flip, this is Bob again. One of the things that um, I think you're spot on there. So for example, when you look at the data of 
employee compliance and participation with, um, let's say, a safety drill or something. Um, one of the ones that has one of the lowest scores is, is, for example, fire evacuation, which is a very common hazard. Fire, evacu fire is probably smoke, fire, um, things are probably far more likely for many facilities than are active shooters, yet it's one of the lower uh, compliance rates. Many of the listeners would probably tell me stories about uh, the last time they did a fire evacuation and how many people stayed at their workstations or stayed at their machine or stayed at their desk or whatever and you know, didn't comply or certainly didn't comply rapidly. One of the highest compliance with people who get interested in it um, for safety and for procedural uh, preparation are active shooter events. So you're absolutely correct. So one way to get people's attention um, is to f talk about preparations for this and somehow along the way you also get in there your uh, tornado warning preparedness plan and your um, flood warning. You, you, you get these other ones kind of in the hazmat or something. I mean, you get these other things done while you've got their attention. Well, the only criticism I've ever heard in doing this approach is to say, well, you're scaring people, Bob. You're scaring people. And that's an interesting question. Um, you know, fear is a motivator, so, uh, but uh, I don't think talking about preparing for an active shooter is what causes the fear. I think it's the real risk that everyone goes home and about once every couple of weeks you watch yet another breaking news story of an active shooter on a university campus or in a uh, healthcare facility or military base or post office or wherever wherever it happens to be transpiring this, this week. And so, um, yes, you are dealing with an emotional subject. There are some people who find it uncomfortable to think about what they would do in this event. But um, frankly, it's, 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 there's no reason not to be prepared for this event because you put people at even greater risk even with psychological discomfort. And so that, that's an interesting barrier. I, I would advocate that you should teach you know, the Heimlich maneuver for people in your cafeteria in your, your facility, even if someone says, oh, I'm uncomfortable with the fact that someone could choke and die. Yes, I'm uncomfortable with that fact, too. That is not sufficient to not be prepared uh, and not know what to do and how to do it. And I think, I think you're absolutely on to something here. Uh, this is one of the subjects that gets the highest sign-up rate Whenever we, we talk in a company or a school, uh, people want to come. They, you know, we, we put a video together with some key training. We talk about the emergency notification language and their behavioral response, and they pay attention to it. Um, I wish I could get that much attention to uh, flight attendants, safety directions on an airplane. But we all ignore that one, and we also ignore quite a few other ones. So yes, let's, let's take advantage of the fact um, to get people better prepared to get our processes better in place so that in the long run we could protect the, the health, well-being, safety, and even the lives um, of the people we're with. And then by doing so, ensuring the continuity of our operations and, um, and it's good business too. That's always the nice kicker at the end of all this. It's the right thing to do. Sure. It protects people. But at the end of the day, it's smart business to be prepared uh, because these events can really devastate, um, not just emotionally and, and, and with lives, but can devastate um, financially and consumer interest and everything else. Dr. Chandler, I had a quick question for you actually now that uh, I'm thinking about it. Something that you brought up uh, during the webinar was contacting law enforcement. And it brought to mind the thought of, would you, would you for example, make law enforcement, the contact information for law enforcement, part of your, you know, your one button launch scenario. So the active shooter begins, you hit the button, within that database of employees being notified, would you also notify law enforcement or would you make it the responsibility of, you know, of someone else or, or, you know, executive leadership to do that once they've been made aware? Yeah, I, I would do it um, as part of the automated system. Uh, I would pre-program that notification. I would work with the law enforcement on the other end of that so they understand both what and why that notification is. Um, and then I would probably ask someone on the senior level to be responsible for ensuring that it went through and maybe kind of a, a double effect. They're okay. They'll take multiple 911 calls, by the way, um, and they'll, 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 they'll handle those. Um, the, our research has indicated that, that people, because of anxiety during these events, 
Um, you would think notifying law enforcement would be so simple, yet we find gaps in it, people who didn't get around to doing it for a while. Um, we'll find gaps of people who, um, I mean, the first notifications often come in from external sources. We do that all the time on active shooters. You know, we get a passerby or a student calling. It's not the it's not the administrative offices on a campus. It's someone else. So I think putting it as part of that is a is a prudent thing to do. Um, it's it's a necessary but not sufficient means of notifying law enforcement. And, and I, I think having someone else designated responsibility for it also um, is okay. I don't think two phone calls to law enforcement about an active shooter is uh, overdoing it. Excellent. Yeah, th those were my thoughts as well. All right. Well, wonderful, guys. Uh, we're at the top of the hour here. We'll go ahead and wrap things up today. Thanks again, Dr. Chandler and Felipe. Uh, and thanks again, everyone, for attending today's webinar sponsored to today by Volo. If you do have any additional questions, please contact Disaster Recovery Journal. Once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a survey on the presentation. We'd appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback to us. Uh, you will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view the recording of today's webinar. On behalf of Disaster Recovery Journal and Volo, thanks again for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks.